Hello everyone, we're now live from Growth Hackers. I'm Emilia Chagas, Growth Hackers CEO, and I'm here to invite a, such a special guest for our Ask Me Anything session today. Uh, but before I bring in Sam from OpenView Partners, I would like to invite you all for Growth Hackers Conference. I have this important reminder for you. Up until tomorrow, July 31st, we have the tickets for the first day of the conference 100% free. So if you go to growthhackersconference.com, you can still get your free tickets for the first day of the conference. And yeah, the conference is coming up September 1st, September uh, 2nd, and they're super excited. I have a great lineup of speakers. You can see everything on our website. So without further ado, I want to bring in our special guest today, Sam Richard. Hey, Sam. Hi. Welcome here. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Love Growth Hackers. Sure. Yeah, yeah. The last time we were here, we were talking about uh, growth specifically for startups uh, with a group of great, great growth professionals from New York, uh, people from Techstars and IBM. Mm -hmm. It was a really cool AMA. If you haven't watched, if you're watching us now and you haven't watched this session, after this, please go to growthhackers.com and check that one out. It's super, super broad, but at the same time, you have so much content there. And Sam, you are a uh, director of growth at OpenView. Mm -hmm. I admire you guys so much. I'm a big fan of your work and Kyle too, your partner. I, I had the opportunity to be in a very small session on pricing with Kyle a couple mm -hmm. years yeah. ago and I took yeah. so much from it. Yeah, he's, he's a yeah. superstar. And yeah. you too, <laughs> you help your portfolio to accelerate top line growth through establishing best practices and processes to support product led growth. So can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do at OpenView and the mm -hmm. reason we are here today, actually, we have a super complete, amazing report that you guys launched and we will dig deeper on that report in a minute. Mm -hmm. But first, I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about what you do and why mm -hmm. OpenView is so different from other VC firms. Yeah, I mean, so um, we all sort of read the news. We we know that venture capital is a really hot space right now. Um, there are a lot of companies making very large investments in B2B SaaS businesses. Um, OpenView is one of them. Um, so we, we sort of differentiate ourselves by looking for companies that are really strong product. Um, if you think about the, the businesses that we've invested in, we're always looking for businesses that start to show traction early on and are really focused on that end user um, and who are building products that sort of run acquisition and retention sort of on their own. Obviously, we, we all know that those product managers working behind the scenes, but who don't necessarily have massive um, sales and marketing expenses where it's sort of coin based. Um, so what I do for the team is I'm on the go to market uh, expansion side. Um, so we have a very large expansion team that makes introductions uh, to customers, introductions to potential um, mentors or anyone like that who you know might be a prospect of ours or who might be a portfolio company of ours. But Kyle and I actually work on the go-to-market team, um, which we help portfolio companies who might have this amazing product, but really grow their grow to market, their go-to-market path. So um, some of our earlier uh, investments were Calendly and Datadog, and we, we firmly believe that they have strong um, products and that they're great at going to market with them. Um, but sometimes people need help on the larger, more strategic projects. So things mm -hmm. like pricing and packaging, which is really yeah. Kyle's forte, um, mm -hmm. or even just having that, that person take a step back and go through your onboarding and really identify that low hanging fruit for you. Or if you're having a problem um, figuring out what your activation metric might be from your product or anything like that, um, the team really works on these in-depth projects, sort of like a, a strategy team would at your business. Um, and we really help portfolio companies and our, our higher tier prospects um, tackle these go-to-market issues so that they can execute on them more quickly. Yeah, that's amazing. And one thing that I really enjoy about your strategy is that you have so many partners working after you invest in a company. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's half and half, right? Uh, you have mm -hmm. you have prospectors and then people working mm -hmm. with the companies on one ones and and mm -hmm. uh, workshops, and that's amazing. So congratulations on that. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of questions here from our mm -hmm. uh, community members, and I would love to go right in. The first one that we have comes from um, Gaurav Aurora, uh, and mm -hmm. Gaurav asks us with growing number of digital consumers uh, and consumer mm -hmm. products in the market, 
in your opinion, I think I know the answer, Sam, to be honest, but in your opinion, growth should be led by marketing, product, engineering, or a combination of them, of these things? Yeah, I, I actually, I've really done a 180 on this. Um, a lot of that was part of this uh, benchmarks product that we put together. Um, but we really found that folks who have a specific growth team um, were less successful than folks who are pulling in different folks from across the business um, to manage growth. So I think it's it's really a combination of teams. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've seen growth teams that have been highly successful who have engineers on them, who have marketers on them, who have product folks on them. Um, but where I, where I see the most success is really this, this idea of a growth squad where you bring in folks who are passionate about grow to market and growth from these different parts of the organization and they're working together. I also think a big part of that is the culture of your organization. I think we've all worked at a place that's been heavily siloed where you don't talk to someone who's not on your team. Um, and I think it's, a, you know, it's indicative of the fact that someone's really siloed if they have this growth team who's not participating outside of that team. Um, so I think it's better to build that culture from the ground up of really having this cross-functional um, teamwork. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Another question that I think relates very well with the report, and I will be showing some screens uh, with graphs from the report in a minute, uh, comes from uh, Resben Girmesteya. And the question is, try you and freemium to convert better. What do you think? Uh, they mm -hmm. decided to go with a 30-day trial, and after that, mm -hmm. users moved to a free plan for six or more days, mm -hmm. and then send them back uh, feedback, discount emails, and then move them to premium. I mean, it's a very <laughs> complex process there that they can figure yeah. out. Uh, but in the end, they didn't convert to keep the awareness of the brand. So, mm -hmm. so that's his question. What do you think about that? And, and how would you approach or how would you recommend mm -hmm. if they were a portfolio company? Yeah, well, so here's the thing. Um, I think that both approaches work it really depends on your business and again that's why we like to work so closely with our portfolio companies is so we can really learn their business um what we found from the study was that um trials tend to have higher conversion rates um, because there's more of a desire to convert really quickly um, but there are more folks in your top of funnel when you have a freemium product so if you think about um, acquisition of the product in and of itself, acquisition is really expensive. So if you want to be getting as many leads as possible into your CRM so that eventually you can convert them, I would recommend um, a, a freemium version. But if you're looking to, to really start running revenue, perhaps you're bootstrapped or something like that, then I would highly recommend a free trial. And it also, you know, it depends on your product and your workflows as well. Um, so, you know, if you don't necessarily have the, the best walkthroughs or things like that, and it's really people heavy, you might want to have that trial, um, but if you know if you do have this product that's really easy to learn and use, then a freemium version is probably going to work for you too. Definitely. I have a mm -hmm. follow-up question on that. We are mm -hmm. we are seeing here one of the pages of your report. It's very complete, you guys. You you can check the link here. We will post them in the comments. Uh, you mentioned that the conversion rates increase as software companies that touch point its prospects. 11 plus touch points uh, performs two times higher than other sales and marketing cadences. So how mm -hmm. are SaaS uh, with, uh, with the highest conversion rates doing these touching points, Sam? All of them within the product or they mm -hmm. include uh, a lot of email, phone calls mm -hmm. and social network. Is there any channel that would be too far or too much? What do you think? Um, I, I think that really depends on your market. So for example, if you're selling to doctors or things like that, like culturally, they might have more of a challenge than someone who's like myself, who's used to buying all different sorts of products and possibly even getting text messages or things like that. Um, but I think when, when you're thinking about touch points and you're thinking about um, who to reach out to, the, the rule of thumb for me and talking to some of the best product led companies out there is they're actually thinking about how can we shrink our funnel so that it's really small and clear for our sales team who they should be reaching out to? So they're doing like quite a few qualification processes, basically saying for every single account that signs up, do they make sense for our business? If so, perhaps we'll qualify them in the product. If not, that's fine. They can use the product, but they're probably not going to hear from us much. Um, and they really have at least two to three different versions of this that they go through before anyone gets any sort of sales touch points. Um, and those sales touch points are really what I'm referring to. So that is a phone call, it is an email, perhaps it's a, a drift message or things like that in your application. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's a little bit of a lighter lift for your sales team if you are doing the right qualification. 
Awesome. And uh, mm -hmm. Sam, how automated are these qualifications, uh, especially in the beginning? <laughs> mm -hmm. How do they work with uh, automation to separate? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have like hundreds or even thousands mm -hmm. of signups a week, how mm -hmm. do they deal with that? Yeah, I mean, some of the, the most successful companies that I've talked to who have the most sort of self-serve and who are really optimizing their sales guys to work on these like heavier accounts, they're using pretty lightweight tools. They're using sort of like a plugin where they can see which company you're coming from. And then they're using some sort of product analytics that their product team would be using in the first place to see how many users you might be adding or things like that, which to me is fairly automated. Um, it's just clear to them with a few steps in Salesforce who they should be going after. But then I've also seen other companies use a more intense setup. They'll use something like Mad Kudu or something like that that does all the work behind the scenes for them. I've also seen Sherlock, which seems like a really great tool for this as well. So it's really based on, you know, how much money do you have to spend? But I would say I would I would recommend against over tooling for this um, because that can be one of the pitfalls is just deciding so much that you want to use some sort of SaaS tool. Oftentimes you already have those tools in your toolbox. You really just have to start stringing them together. Awesome. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about conversion from uh, different free um, channels, for a premium mm -hmm. or trial. And now I would like to go a little bit further. Vlad Kellis from our mm -hmm. community asked something about referrals, which is really interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. He's asking which referral systems or methods do you recommend for a SaaS or premium model? And his reasoning is he's seen so many models of retail websites, storage clouds, mm -hmm. or even writing uh, the app but he cannot find something that fits them or makes them uh, even discover the option of implementing it. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, he mentions that retail website offers credit for shopping, Airbnb mm -hmm. offers some uh, discounts and, and some extra cash. Uh, for every friend invited on Dropbox, you get free space. Uh, Evernote, you get points. So what are the recommendations that you would make for portfolio companies uh, reasoning on that? Again, I, I feel like this is really a custom fit. Um, I, I think that Airbnb is a great example, or even retail is a great example, because you can always just take a little bit of money off the top. But in SaaS, you really can't do that. You're not going to discount perhaps one month for a referral. Um, I've often found um, in SaaS, you actually get a lot of referrals just because someone wants to be seen as the expert in the space. So sometimes in, instead of it being, you know, this tit for tat or this value for value, um, you actually need to sort of uh, step that person up from a visible pers like perspective. So um, HubSpot has like some great programs where you can be like the top agency in the region or things like that, where it's really just an award um, or it's some sort of um, public acknowledgement of how hard someone's working and how many folks they're getting onto the platform. And I find that that sort of social capital is is often really important in SaaS. So if you think about myself who's a growth pro professional, and I'm sure all of you are, sometimes you, you want that LinkedIn hype. You want some of that buzz around you more in a professional sense um, than you would be interested in any sort of SaaS discount, right? So in the SaaS space, you have to think about it outside of perhaps a discount might work or something like that. Um, sometimes you have to think about it as like, highlighting that person's work too. That's super interesting. And it goes yeah. uh, along with the uh, end user era that we're living right. in. And who's mm -hmm. making the decision really is not the team leader anymore, the manager anymore, or even the mm -hmm. CIO anymore. It's much more about uh, connecting to that user and helping them uh, make a case for your software within their team and their company, right? Right. And I think about how I recommend software to the portfolio. And I would feel strange sort of doing this like very formal uh, way of just saying like, hey, let me get you my discount code or things like that, where, you know, I'm happy to do that with my girlfriends for a pair of shoes. But I often, you know, I'm happy to recommend that application or something like that in a Slack channel or in um, a LinkedIn post, um, just so that I can look like an expert and look like someone who's known mm -hmm. what they're doing. And that perhaps people will turn to me when they have questions about that particular space in the future. That's interesting. Well, mm -hmm. going a little bit back on uh, on channels, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to plug in here the another uh, another page from, from your study. Uh, and you mm -hmm. mentioned acquisition channels, uh, a mix by customer type. I think that's super interesting. And that goes for mm -hmm. referrals as well as part of mm -hmm. the organic channel. Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. we were discussing referrals just now. But uh, my question actually is, uh, between these, uh, you say the overall organic traffic seems to be most common for companies selling to smaller business. 
and in, referrals included there, uh, while sales is most popular, popular at companies that go after enterprises, which probably have larger deal sizes. So what are the differences do you see between SMBs and enterprises when we're talking about product-led growth strategy, Sam? Yeah. Well, when I, when I see companies that are going after the very small business or the small business market, often oftentimes um, they're more likely to be able to put a lot of thought into their content strategy. Um, so I think a lot about HubSpot, who early on um, back in like 2012 started really um, building this very strong SEO engine. They basically found every single question that a young marketer would ever Google, um, terms of compensation or how to use Google Analytics or things like that. They really dominated that market um, in terms of SEO and it's really had long tail implications for them as they've uh, gone to market with it. But also if you think about acqu acquiring customers, well, if you're selling to very small businesses or small businesses, so you're having to acquire a lot of customers in order to sort of make ends meet. And it's too expensive for you to be doing that with sales, right? Because they're just gonna be yeah. pounding the phones and they're probably still not going to be paying for themselves. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, you know, you can see this higher paid marketing approach, um, especially with search engine marketing, you're really looking for someone who has a lot of intent um, because you can pretty much, that's sort of like coin operated. You can find anyone who's looking for your specific tool or your specific offering um, with search engine marketing. And I see that more commonly practiced um, with these sort of uh, high velocity, um, low dollar point deals as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I always recommend to folks, even those who are working on enterprise deals to really make those investments in content and SEO early on because they, they first of all take a long time to start paying off, but when they do, they're paying off in dividends. Okay, it's still mm -hmm. on the channels. There is another question from uh, Ryan Dixon, and mm -hmm. he says, as opposed to the weekly or fortnightly sprint for testing of innovation, testing channels as things like content marketing and ads mm -hmm. would need weeks to gather uh, adequate mm -hmm. feedback. So his question is, how much time should one dedicate to testing each new channel? What do you think? Yeah. Well, it really depends on the channel. And if you're taking these organic channels, um, I might even say quarters. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we do um, at OpenView and with the portfolio is we really track their share of voice. So if you think about the keywords that you want to be known for, so OpenView wants to be known for product-led growth, we track how often uh, we're appearing for product-led growth and how we're moving up in the spots in Google search. That takes months to change that. That yeah. takes months of like That's really nice. strong thought. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, so for content, I would say it takes many quarters. Um, for any sort of paid marketing or paid acquisition, I would at least give things a month. Um, I used to manage all paid marketing at Catalant um, and we would do sort of like geo by geo um, mm -hmm. tests with different things like billboards or things like that. And those would take at least six weeks to start seeing uh, ROI on them as well. Yeah, I think uh, we talk a lot about high tempo and how testing mm -hmm. things in one or two weeks. That's amazing when you have mm -hmm everything already validated and you're actually mm -hmm. implementing something that would uh, require some changing and give you some incremental results. But if you're mm -hmm. testing something that is a uh, hyper growth uh, strategy or, or something new completely like a new channel, definitely mm -hmm. this one or two weeks, many times they are not enough. Right, and, and, and if you're new to market, time. If you're new to a market or you're coming to an emerging market that's not necessarily super saturated yet, how are you mm -hmm. even going to have enough volume of folks actually looking for it to, to really understand it within two weeks? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, there's another question here mm -hmm. and it comes from Elia Morland. Um, considering there appears to be a lack of consensus regarding what uh, terms actually mean, <laughs> it would be interesting to get your perspective. She says, mm -hmm. what, what do you draw the line between acquisition and activation? Yeah, I think acquisition is really, um, it, it's really basically CRM marketing to me. Um, so if you think about the way you've laid out your CRM, you have this version of a lead, you have this version of a contact, and usually a lead is converted to a contact once you have this opportunity, and there's been discussion about purchasing. So to me, acquisition means you have a one opportunity on that contact. So you've acquired them, they're paying you, done. Um, but activation is really different. Um, it really is a one-time deal. Um, I typically think of it in terms of the product in and of itself. I think you can have a business that's run and has act 
um, acquisition uh, being measured all on its own, nece not necessarily with activation. So I'm thinking about tools like Marketo or things like that, where mm -hmm. um, I was forced to use it. I wasn't happy about it. It had a terrible UI. Um, I never was truly activated on that product. I learned how to use it, but I never really saw the value in it, right? Um, it. Activation is really that end user seeing the value in that product and having this aha moment, um, usually within the first month or so of using it, where they mm -hmm. say, I see the value in this, I understand this, I can articulate this to another person, and I've taken this mm -hmm. action that sort of unlocks it for me. So I really okay. see activation happening in the product. I think people can help you get to the point of activation, um, but it really needs to be just like this one-time thing that happens in the product while acquisition is really just sort of this overarching theme of, yeah, of like you a, hopefully a, getting. A simple sign up uh, and then exactly. and a user actually uh, performing a certain amount of actions that you predefine as activation. related to your activation. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it completely or not at all uh, connected to pain? To user pain or being paid? Yeah, user pain. Um, I think it is. Um, I think that there are users who are going to have a lot of pain if they've been acquired, but not necessarily activated. Um, mm -hmm. I think that activation is required to solve for a user's pain. Uh, I, I would. I, I like the way that you sort of put that uh, together because activation is really showing that user that you're solving for their pain. Um, yeah. And that basically the product that they hired you or the pain point that they hired your product for has been solved. Um, so I think that's a good way to approach it as well. Great, great. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a follow up question on activation too. Uh, you mentioned there on your uh, report there, there on page 25 about activation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, again, a very complete and interesting report. I highly recommend everyone to go there and, and get your own. Uh, so companies that offer a free version on, or trial of the product are 2.5 times more likely to measure that aha moment that you were uh, talking mm -hmm. about for users mm -hmm. than their counterparts who uh, don't allow users to try the product before purchase. So what are the best activation practices that you have seen working, especially mm -hmm. for, for companies or, mm -hmm. or great products that you see out there? Yeah, I think it's a three-pronged approach. Um, so the first is that it can only happen once. A user can't keep getting reactivated. It basically has to be this one moment. Um, it has to be easily done. So if more than 50% or if fewer than 50% or 40% of people are doing it, it's not an activation metric. It's like a power user metric. Um, so that's sort of the first bucket. And then the second bucket is that it has to be done really relatively quickly. So between seven to 30 days are really the benchmarks that we've looked at. Um, so basically it has to be easily done. Um, it has to be done quickly, can only be done once. And then finally, this is sort of the extra credit part of it, but I also think activation can differ by persona. So one of our, our portfolio companies is Expensify. Um, if mm -hmm. I am just submitting my expenses to you, my CFO, mm -hmm. our activation points are gonna be very different in the product because I'm oh, having yeah. this pain solved um, by just mm -hmm. submitting my expenses via, via an app on my phone. And you're having this pain solved because it, it sort of uses AI and goes through the expenses for you and shows you which ones to yell at me about, right? Yeah, um, so yeah. those are very different pain points and those are really very different activation metrics as well. Is there any type of prioritization of things or user type? Uh, definitely. <laughs> Talk a yeah, little bit more about that. Well, and going back to thinking about how to narrow your funnel and have your sales team reach out to those folks, um, you really have to start prioritizing those uh, personas too. I mean, if you and I, uh, me as a, an employee and you as a CFO, sign up to trial Expensify, um, in an ideal scenario, you would be um, a number one prospect and I would probably not even be two or three. Um, and those personas and the way that you're using the product should be indicative to that sales team that you are an mm -hmm. ideal persona and I'm not. On the sales perspective, but on the user mm -hmm. perspective, though, if you don't solve for both, you won't get anywhere, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, or you could be, I mean, or you could be like Salesforce, where I'm just constantly yelling at sales guys to fill out Salesforce because it's providing value for me, but not necessarily for them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so another question here from Arslan uh, Sajid. 
what, uh, which in, it's about metrics, so it's a really mm -hmm. great follow up. Uh, which are the top three SaaS metrics you consider when calculating or estimating growth for the SaaS business? And on your report, you, you bring mm -hmm. a whole, uh, session on PQL metrics. And I think that's super rich, super mm -hmm. interesting for, for everybody to, mm -hmm. to consider. So which ones would you, I mean, he asked about the three top, but feel free mm -hmm. to expand on that. Yeah, um, all we ever do at OpenView is talk about SaaS, bench SaaS metrics. Um, so this is our product benchmarks data. So this is stuff that's coming out of uh, product-led businesses. But if we're actually taking um, folks data down for our SaaS benchmarks right now, which is really more of these uh, traditional SaaS metrics. So things like cost of acquisition, CAC payback, lifetime value, um, MRR, those kinds of things. We're actually running that now. And I highly recommend taking a look at that benchmark report too. It's, it's used heavily in the industry and it's great. Um, so I would say some of my favorite metrics are really, um, the first is natural rate of growth. So we've been working on that at OpenView. Um, to better understand what a product-led business looks like when you sort of peel back the, the sales and marketing engine. So if you think about um, a business like a car, um, ultimately sales and marketing is really the foil that goes outside of it. And it, it can make it look really great. It can make it into a Mercedes or it can make it into a Jaguar or it can make it into a tiny Honda outside. Um, so when you start peeling back um, the sales and marketing and that's really like coin operated, like if you took that away tomorrow, um, which for so many of us is very similar to what's going on with COVID-19. Um, what would the business look like? How would it run on its own? Is the product sort of bringing in its own deals? Um, and in order to, to really sort of estimate that, we take the natural rate of growth, which is uh, your, your rate of ARR growth in the last year. Um, and then you multiply that um, by what percentage of uh, your revenue is coming directly from your product. And then what percentage of your, um, uh, of your product has organic signups. So I have some examples and there's definitely the link to that. Um, but that's mm -hmm. my favorite so far, just because there have been so many businesses that I've worked with at OpenView who um, just have this like incredible natural rate of growth, um, especially Calendly. They just have this amazing viral loop and that mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like even if you're doing marketing, you're just helping them move along. Um, that's how good they are. Um, and we all want to run a business and build a business like that. Um, I think other really important things when you're looking at a business is also your CAC payback period. So mm -hmm. when you think about a business, um, anywhere under a year is really healthy. Um, but you know, any, anything under six months is truly incredible. Um, that's why I ask you to look at those benchmarks because they're really great. Um, but how long it takes for you to pay back the cost of acquiring that customer and getting them onboarded is really important um, when you think about business efficiency as well. Um, and then finally, not necessarily a SaaS metric, um, but you know, I, I, I really do think it's important to look at diversity within a company. Um, I am always looking for that when I'm moving to my next role, um, as well as when I'm looking at teams and trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are many of you in the audience who've scrolled through a business um, about me page and said, oh, I don't really fit in here. Um, so yeah. I think that's an important thing to look at too. Wow, that's great, that's great. And how, uh, how do you see that uh, these metrics connecting for any SaaS business mm -hmm. on your portfolio? Do you see a highly, uh, I mean, it, it really connects the mm -hmm. high end jar with uh, a good balance between CAC and LTV. Mm -hmm. Also the diversity, I would love mm -hmm. if you had some, <laughs> some yeah. benchmarks on that. <laughs> well, we do actually on the SaaS awesome. benchmarks. Um, we started publishing and asking that last year. Um, so that's awesome. just sasbenchmarks.com. Um, okay. I do, I do think it's all just sort of, we're always, as growth hackers, right, we're always looking for the next best thing. Like, what's the next greatest way to start acquiring customers? And I think having a low cost of acquisition means that you can be creative. Um, and if you're paying it back quickly, that means people are loving the product. That means it's creative. It's solving for their pain. Um, if you're having this amazing natural rate of growth, that means that you're not necessarily having to throw a lot of sales and marketing dollars at it because it is such a great product that it's selling itself in a lot of ways, obviously not in every way. Um, or the marketing that you're doing is so impactful that you don't have to pay a lot to amplify it, right? Because your brand really resonates with folks. And then finally, I think a driver of all of that is just what sort of diversity do you have? And I don't mean the, the way people look or people's gender or anything like that. I mean, diversity of thought. So like, do they have different beliefs or are you all sitting around at a table just echoing each other? 
Um, because yeah. if that's happening and you're not having these passionate conversations, um, your business is probably, you know, feeling very bland. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we like to see a little bit of arguments. We like to see some of that diversity of thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I was a, a movie came to my mind as you were describing <laughs> that many team leaders <laughs> meeting mm -hmm. here. And mm -hmm. definitely when we see things, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot of people describing their issues and possible solutions to, the, to those and they don't always agree. That's mm -hmm. where we get to the rich uh, ideas that will mm -hmm. actually feed our growth strategy, right? Because right. if you have many ideas and they go in different ways, what you do, you test all of them <laughs> and you see which exactly. one you see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ideally, right? Ideally. Right, ideally. <laughs> On the opposite and you could always go with the one with the higher voice or the sharpest yeah. pen. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, not sometimes idea. it comes down to who has access to the most data and who can make the most compelling argument with data as well. So. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, some other uh, questions now from the community to go broader on the mm -hmm. growth strategy as a whole. Or this one from Tapash Mandalia is based on your own experiences. How do you build and scale a growth team or a growth function? Mm -hmm. How to build and scale a growth team and a growth function? I think that's a good question. Um, there are really two approaches to it. Um, uh, I think Andrew Chen does the best job of sort of explaining uh, the different sort of teams and the way to to scale them up, uh, but mm -hmm. to sort of uh, use his words in a way. Um, you can either have like sort of a separate growth team where it's a growth mm -hmm. person um, who manages it and it's very separate and it sort of reports up to product or reports up to an executive. Um, and it's made up of engineers and it's made up of designers and it's made up of product folks and perhaps even marketers. Um, or you can have this idea of a squad, which is really leads coming from every single team, your traditional sales, you've got your marketers, you've got your product folks and taking learnings from one another and then taking them back to their teams. I think it really depends on your internal culture um, and whether or not mm -hmm you have these sort of cross-functional folks in your business who you feel like could be managing go-to-market strategy as well as their day jobs. Um, but I really like the idea of having these squads because I think people are more passionate about coming to work in the day-to-day -day if they feel like they're having an impact on the future of it. Um, and I've seen mm -hmm. instances where product folks or engineers sort of get disheartened because they don't necessarily know what's going on or where mm -hmm. marketing folks are disrespected because they don't necessarily mm -hmm. know how the product that works that well. So I, I think a cross-functional growth organization um, is really a good way to, to also build your culture internally. Now, scaling that is challenging, um, but I really <laughs> think it's it's all about uh, letting go of your Legos in a way um, and letting, you know, teaching folks what you've learned before and then bringing more folks on and teaching them the ways. Yeah. And we yeah. also see this uh, as a moving piece as mm -hmm. growth becomes more and more adopted across whole uh, all other teams, right? We have mm -hmm. seen uh, companies where it all started uh, with growth as a consulting uh, right. team or area, mm -hmm. and then it moved to a more a squad like, and mm -hmm. even uh, where some uh, some companies are already moving the growth professionals inside the product. So the product team led by mm -hmm. growth, like on its bone <laughs> and, I love that. Uh, and the, yeah at yeah, heart of this structure and it's really exciting when all the mm -hmm. sprints the product sprints are mm -hmm. are done with growth in mind and in a product-led growth way where you don't have sprints as much as growth meetings right. uh, to discuss future features or product uh, the way the product will evolve well, and I think it's really attractive too when folks who are not necessarily sales guys or who are not necessarily lead gen um, are still being held to a quota in a way. So, you know, when you're building a product, you're using at least two weeks of engineering time, which is probably very high cost to your organization. Um, you should be on the line for a certain percentage of revenue bump from that feature or that offering, right? Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes product folks are not held accountable for that. And I'm sure there are folks who out there who'd love to kill me for saying that, but <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's the highest, uh, it's one of the highest costs. Why not also uh, Even be if you're not for... targeting, yeah, if you're not mm -hmm. targeting impact in a right. revenue uh, level, at least at least use it right and we see so many mm -hmm. product teams not looking at either of those mm -hmm. which is yeah. really weird right. yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is another question here, also a uh, brother one uh, from Nathan, uh, Nathan Lippi. Uh, how do you determine the size or the scope of your growth experiment? I'm mm -hmm. sure you also run some growth experiments within mm -hmm. OpenView mm -hmm. and you also have your portfolio companies that mm -hmm. run tons of growth experiments. And one interesting, I will, I will talk about that later, but mm -hmm. one interesting uh, finding from the report is the amount of experiments related to mm -hmm. growth. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll cover that in a minute. But how do you uh, go about uh, actually determining the size or the scope of these experiments? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everyone always has this like backlog of tech debt that they need to get to. And I think experiments are the same way. Um, but prioritization has always been the same for me, even if I'm at home um, deciding what to do that night or something like that. Um, you always sort of grid it out and you decide, you know, what's the what's going to get me the highest ROI for the least amount of work. Um, and that's really how I prioritize experiments. So if there's you know, if there's a shift in UI that um, is really just me recoding a button or something like that, that I, my hypothesis is that it's going to increase conversion by 5%, um, I'm going to pick that every time than sort of like rewriting all of my landing page copy um, for hoping that someone stays on that page, you know, one minute longer or something like that. So I think it's really t-shirt sizing, having um, a framework of building hypotheses around um, how you think experiments will turn out. Um, and then really prioritizing them on what's the easiest and what's got the potential highest ROI. So if you have something that's a huge heavy lift um, that has mm -hmm. like a potentially massive ROI, you need to figure out how you can break it up so that it becomes lighter lifts um, for mm -hmm. how possibly, you know, making that sweet middle spot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And mm -hmm. uh, on the topic that we were uh, talking uh, along with this one, the amount of monthly growth experiments run, mm -hmm. what did you find that, mm -hmm. I mean, it, were, were there like a finding that you thought, oh, this is something I wasn't expecting or everything that you found in the report, you were like, this is, this is how I, I imagine things to be. Yeah, I think we all hold ourselves accountable to a pretty high level. And we read about these organizations that have these like high velocity testing um, cycles like Vistaprint or like Wayfair or something like that, who are just running tests all the time. Um, so we think that that's how a business is run. Um, but in reality, you know, as long as you're running experiments, you're probably doing a great job. Um, we found that high growth companies are just more likely to be running experiments. If you're running three plus experiments, um, it didn't really make a difference if you're running 10 plus, but just mm -hmm. running experiments and having that culture in place made the biggest difference as to whether or not you were gonna fall into a high growth bucket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like Nike, you just have to do it. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, on, on the state of growth by Growth Hackers, mm -hmm. is a study we publish every year. On the mm -hmm. last one, we actually noticed that the amount of uh, experiments that run as a working, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you run an experiment and then by the learning phase, you uh, acquire all of your uh, data and, and what happened after that. And if you understand that the experiment worked or you it didn't work or sometimes they're inconclusive. And the teams that had the highest uh, growth rates uh, within their companies actually had the least amount of experiments that worked. That's mm -hmm. another uh, interesting data that we found there. Uh, I know that you, you were not looking into that li uh, like that mm -hmm. in this report, but how do you feel about it? For us, it's a matter of taking risks. And if you're taking mm -hmm. larger, I mean, if you're taking more risks, it will, get mm -hmm. right less times, I mean, a fewer number of times than, yeah. uh, I love than that. if you're not taking, yeah. Yeah, I wish I'd have had that data earlier on in my career. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that. I, I think not only are you taking risks, but you're also learning from failure, um, which I think is um, a little non-pervasive in tech culture. Um, there definitely needs to be more learning from failure. Um, and also choosing not to do something is sometimes more powerful than just doing something as well. Um, so I think that plays into all of those. Yeah, yeah, that goes back into prioritization. Mm -hmm. uh, right, something exactly. Something that we were discussing before. Mm -hmm. uh, you also talk a little bit about COVID on your report. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's a, that's a topic related to the next question from Oleg Triers. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Oleg says, hi, Sam. Uh, the most popular advice a lot of us get when growing our business is never quit or keep going or never stop, never stopping. Um, as a director of growth with a robust portfolio, do you have any mm -hmm. advice on when and how to actually know that it's okay to quit while you're ahead? Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a loaded question, but I think it connects to this time where so many businesses are struggling. So what's your professional take on not growing and at what point is, it, is this not growing a sign that it's about time to quit while we, you're still ahead? Um, yeah. What do you think, Sam? Oh, I struggle with this a lot. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that there's no end in sight, unfortunately, as much as we try and tell ourselves differently. Um, and I think that the way that we've done business um, is really going to change. That being said, um, there's sort of this uh, this mythology around Silicon Valley that some of the best businesses are built during some of the worst eras in economic history. Um, and I tend to agree with that quite a bit. Um, I do find that um, as like a pretty conservative minded investor myself, um, you know, you want businesses that have done really well during an economic crunch. Um, early on in my career, I was highly uh, involved with the on-demand space, and I was seeing all sorts of things become on-demand, so much that it felt frivolous, um, and it just felt like there was way too much VC money in the Valley, and there was just so many bad businesses being built. It made me feel like I needed to shower every time I came back to the East Coast. Um, so... I that doesn't answer your question, um, but I think sometimes you just know. Um, and I think as a founder or as someone who is a leader in a business, there have been points for me in my career where I've just not wanted to come in anymore. And I love work. Um, and when that starts happening and it stops being fun for you and it starts being work or you stop learning and it starts really being work and it starts being painful, I think you should decide how do I get out of this in the most graceful way as possible? Um, and how do I treat the people that have worked for me? Um, the best that I possibly can. Like, how can I really pay them back? Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's, that's something to be mindful, the commitments mm -hmm. that you made throughout the journey. I think that's right. something that Oleg here brings. Uh, mm -hmm. Should everybody just wait it out uh, mm -hmm. until a full on bankruptcy? It doesn't seem to be the right way to do this. But right. at the same time, uh, taking back all of these commitments that you've made and making a hard decision can be mm -hmm. very free. Right. Yeah. Right. It can. Yeah. And I, sometimes letting go and things like that are really freeing as well. So um, there have been much better people than me who've written about this. Ben Horowitz, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And I highly recommend reading him as well. Yeah. Hard Things yeah. About Hard Things. Mm -hmm. It's one of my yeah. favorite books. Really good. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. On COVID, uh, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a subject that you, um, mm -hmm. uh, you bring on right in the beginning of the report. Super interesting there, uh, this data. It proves um, product-like growth is your secret weapon during downturn. Uh, mm -hmm. What did you find there during the early uh, weeks and months of COVID? Yeah, well, um, we're still dealing with it. I, I would say in terms of um, the SaaS data that I have had access to, um, the SaaS market has not been hit as hard as we thought it would be. Um, Wall Street's a little crazy right now um, in terms of the decisions that investors are making, but it doesn't seem like you can do any better than a SaaS uh, business right now, at least from a market perspective. Um, that being said, if you're if you're running a product-led business, um, uh, we actually index product-led public businesses versus SaaS product uh, SaaS mm -hmm. public businesses who are That's probably a little bit more yeah, right yeah now. exactly yeah. yeah. Um, SaaS businesses are doing well. Um, the rest of the economy really tanked this spring, um, but SaaS businesses kept it together after a minor dip. But product businesses, so think about Zoom, think about Slack, think about um, you know Cloudflare and those guys, uh, because they're products led and people can really pick them up on the fly and they have these really short sales cycles and the product really gives all the value when you're working at 12 o'clock at night because your one year old has been bothering you all day. Um, those are the type of businesses that have really thrived during uh, this downturn um, and where everyone's working from home. And I mean, they don't have high cost of acquisition. Um, and yeah. they've always, you know, they've always been dispersed teams. They haven't necessarily had these like massive uh, sales functions where people have had to travel all the time in order to win deals. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, you know, while this hasn't been a great time for anyone, um, they've really been set up for success from the beginning. 
Mm-hmm. And how about businesses that are launching right now? There, are, there is a question here from Abstract. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you, do any of you have a handy checklist list for beta launch? What are the things we must be doing while uh, going for a beta launch? Mm-hmm. How do you acquire those early adopters and taking this timing right now, like in the midst of a pandemic, we still see businesses. Uh, launching and, and new businesses coming. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? How are you approaching uh, mm-hmm. new businesses uh, at this moment? Yeah, I mean, I think now is one of the best times to start a business. Um, you're definitely going to have a lot of folks' attention. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot more sort of community living online than there would be in person um, because, you know, I miss people. Uh, we're all, you know, we're humans. We we really like to interact with folks. Um, so and that's I think biological. I just find out too. It's right. not a matter of cultural behavior. Yeah, yeah. That's mm-hmm. biological. That's something that. Right. That's why we're all missing it so much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, you know, communities like Growth Hackers. Um, you know, it, there's never been a better time to be part of an online community. You've got Growth Hackers. You've got Reddit. You've got Product Hunt. Um, there's all kinds of niche Slack channels for whatever you're interested in. Um, this is where you find your betas. You have to be sort of this go-getter, this curator of different things. Yeah. Um, and I recommend, I actually keep a, a Google document of interesting communities that are interesting to me that I would you know, either aspire to be a part of or join or where I'd love to have some of my content featured. Um, and I, I recommend sort of keeping track of that because I think online community is really important. Obviously, you only really get out of it what you give. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, you can't just like drop a link and say, join my beta and then leave. Um, it's really having more conversations with folks. Um, but you know, I think there's never really, you you kind of need to learn in the early days, right? right? So like, it's not only acquiring users, but actually learning from these early adopters and these early users. Yeah, exactly. And you're not just learning by watching their behavior from, you know, your, your God view and your analytics engine. You're really just asking them questions about how they do their job. Um, yeah. I, I, when I was a dispatch, I um, was helping build a software for service providers. So I would drive around in like terrifying middle of nowhere places in like the deep south um, just to learn, you know, what does a plumber do all day? What are his problems? Wow. Um, and I think that's sort of the best user research. And we ended up developing a ton of features off that, that if I hadn't actually gone and done that for a week, we would have never known about. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. That's something that uh, my own experience has mm-hmm. done similar uh, for me, having mm-hmm. worked as on, on the shoe, exact same shoes as my <laughs> users. And, exactly. yeah. uh, it really brings a lot of light into what the real issues re- really are and how to mm-hmm. solve for them. Uh, mm-hmm. There is another question here also that is outside of SAS. I know SAS is your <laughs> is more of your arena, but if you think of other industries, well, I did. And- I started in B two C. I always wanted to work in oh, fashion, okay. and we we joke. I mean, we talk now about how some of the best product led practitioners do come from B two C because you have to learn to be lean, right? Yes. Oh, true. Yeah. And goes, even from for Sean Ellis or uh, that that coin growth hacking, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. he also uh, drank a lot of the B two C pool for sure. And mm-hmm. um, Anthony Morris asks, do you have any advice on acquisition strategy for more technical IT products? So it's not says one click and you're in you're in type of product. Mm-hmm where the user needs to invest more time to create a solution or hence prove the value. What did you say to Anthony? This is all I ever work on. So I like to work on the more um, boring products, some some of the more boring, boring prospects. B- B2B, yeah. I call it back to boring. Love it. I love developer tools, um, <laughs> especially if the founders are Israeli and it's like in the cybersecurity space, um, because that means that no one wants to give that product a try. They need to go through this entire process. Um, I think, you know, a lot of it is a video. Um, a lot of it is a video. Um, it's, it's really better understanding, um, you know, what's the use case, like, what do they want to start seeing in the product and what are really going to check those boxes for them? One of my favorite things about this market and this audience is that they're extremely loyal and they're really coming in and they're looking to make sure that you have certain features, certain integrations and certain security. Um, and then I think that there are a few people who take a really interesting approach. So I really like sneak, um, they sort of have this, like, offshoot which is an off an open source version of their product where you can actually install it and start using it and feeling safe on it and then eventually upgrade 
Um, another thing that I love is Datadog, who originally um, OpenView invested in and led their Series B. Um, but they have a, a, some, some straightforward things that you can actually download and start trying before you actually start paying them. But you do actually end up loading a ton of data. And I highly recommend that you go through Datadog's onboarding flow. Um, because it's super simple and shows you why you're doing these things. Um, because it is a heavy lift to start implementing Datadog and start using it, but it takes you through the entire problem and it shows you why you should be doing it. They have one of the best onboarding processes I've ever seen. Um, and then some of the, the newer uh, companies that I've been evaluating, one of them is called Gray Noise. They actually share a lot of their information, even though like they're a search engine for um, potential threats for you on the internet, which is like, a little terrifying, um, a very heavy lift for someone to start actually implementing in, inside of their own business, but they actually give back to the community by identifying key threats um, across the world's internet right mm -hmm. now. So um, I recommend taking a look at all of those products and really finding inspiration for them because they are all huge heavy lifts for a developer to implement in their own business, but they've figured out different ways to get around that. Awesome. Yeah. Then uh, those were the questions so far from mm -hmm. the community. Thank you so much. Before we go, I would love to ask you, how are you investing in your personal growth in these uh, times of COVID and pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so actually Scott Maxwell, who's the founder of OpenView, has um, been working with us on the power of logic and problem solving and communication. So I'm really going back to like my early days as a consultant and like relearning how to logically communicate my points of view. Um, oftentimes I've been heavily reliant on sort of lobbying folks and talking to them in hallways and making sure they understand my point of view. Um, Cause I can just be like a really cordial person, but sometimes you just have to express yourself in an email or over slides. Yeah. Um, so he's actually sent us all this book um, that mm -hmm. I highly recommend called The Power of Logic. <laughs> Um, strategic mm -hmm. communication consulting. Mm -hmm. So that is my my personal growth uh, project for the quarter. Um, otherwise, I am we are moving, um, and I have a one year old. So otherwise, just trying to stay sane. My goodness, I I moved too. <laughs> I've moved too with my family, my three year old, in the beginning of the pandemic, and oh, now we have, uh, yeah, we're more connected to nature. Everything is great, but in I mean, until we got here, <laughs> quite a project. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, if yeah. you if you have friends who are parents, just check in on them because they are not okay. <laughs> yes, they need your help. They need your help. Don't yeah. be that selfish uh, single person friend. Yeah, don't be that person. <laughs> yeah, just I don't want to hear about your sourdough. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. definitely. <laughs> Okay, Sam, thank you so yeah. much. Everyone, thank just go to OpenView's website, download the 2020 SaaS product benchmark from the superstar Sam and Kyle. I highly recommend it. And everyone, of course, we have Growth Hackers Conference coming up September 1st and 2nd. And Sam, I know you, you will be there and your team yeah. will be there for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Just go to growthhackersconference.com and get your ticket. It's free up until tomorrow. So the clock's ticking. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Bye. I'm so glad to have you here. Bye-bye, everyone.